going to start with some uh, programming of cloud services using Akka. And we have Jonas Bonier from TypeSafe, where he is the co-founder and the CTO. And thank you for coming. Thanks. And Intelligence test. Is that fine? <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me over here. Uh, I'm actually located in, up in Uppsala, so it wasn't that far. I'm, I'm pleased to be here on my home, my home arena, you can say. Um, so I represent TypeSafe. TypeSafe is a is a is a company that that uh, just just give you a short intro to what to what, what we do. We we're the, we're, we're the company behind the Scala programming language. I mean, some of the talks earlier have, have mentioned that. So we, so we like maintain the, the compiler and stuff like that. We also have, have, have a, sort of a, like a middleware, you can say, a runtime. That's called Akka. That's, that, and that's the, the essential piece I'm going to talk about today. And we'll have some other tools on top of that, like the, the Play Web Framework for building web apps like Rails, uh, like a sort of node type. Of, 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 of platforms that sits on top of Arca and so on. So, but I'll start to be like sort of taking a step, taking st a step back and sort of set context, right? As you as you're probably all aware of, and some 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 of the talks um, this morning also touched on that, is that the the rules of the game have like fundamentally changed the last the the, the last years and. If we, I mean, sometimes we just we just li live in the in the in the in the in the present. We don't like take we like take it for for granted so it can be useful sometimes to to like look back and what have actually changed the f like the last fif 15 years and what is about to 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 change because things will change even rapidly i mean in the upcoming uh, in the, like next 10 to 15 years i think so on the left hand side here we have like sort of the context or the environments the requirements of apps were like written in the 60s 80s and and 90s perhaps even early 2000 and on the, on the right hand side, we have sort of the requirements of applications today. So applications used to be written for single, for single machines, like, app, I mean, sort of, uh, you, 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 where you, just did, did, did you just deployed your application on, on a single machine and you were basically done with it, right? But, but to, to today, most applications are, are, are deployed on clusters of machines, like cloud computing is the norm. And most of these uh, sort of machines used to run single core processors. Today, I mean, it's really, it's really hard to find, um, I mean, even, uh, like a, even a, a, a dual core. I mean, even my phone is, is, a, is, a, is a quad core today. And that's like, completely changed the, the picture. We can't like shoehorn everything into like, you know, the old von Neumann machine any longer. We really need to, to like break free of that and, and like accept that the world is concurrent. It's always been concurrent. It's just that we can't fake it any longer, essentially. You know, RAM used to be really, 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 really expensive. That also had a lot of implications in how, in, in how we design software. Today, RAM is ridiculously cheap. We can actually suck in our whole uh, data set in memory, like some of the, of, of the talks already have mentioned that they do. Uh, ex disk used to be very, very expensive. That's why, I mean, all, all SQL databases use in-place updates. That's just, that's just wrong. There's no reason to like overwrite your data and then have uh, like another so, like whole set of tools to do like auditing data mining for, for for historical data. Should always keep data around. Essentially, I mean everything is uh, like I think I think it was Pat Helen that said that that the that the, 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 the SQL database is just like a cache of the of, of a subset of your log. And, because everything is there. I mean, even Oracle, like journal everything to log. It's just they expose this, this like view on 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 that data, and without giving us access to the to to the real log. There's really no reason to to do that any longer because disk is so cheap, right? Also, completely cha changes the game. Networks used to be really really slow. Today they are insanely fast. It's sometimes faster to write to the network than actually storing things on disk. There are also have big implications in how we design software. These applications, 
it used to be written for, for, for quite few concurrent users. I mean, I remember when like hundreds of like or thousands of users were actually fairly big applications, like 10,000, yeah, it was huge. I mean, today, most applications are put on the internet. I mean, they are exposed to potentially hundreds of thousands of users, sometimes millions of users. And all these users, they, they, they used to produce fairly small data sets, so there was not that much data to like process and to ship around. But, but today, since most things are actually distributed, uh, and data needs to be available almost in in instant uh, in instantaneously, right? Uh, uh, so users, they used to be like okay with latency in seconds. And they, I, mean, I remember like sitting, like refreshing the browser and almost going for a coffee before it actually came back. Today. I mean, forget it. Users are extremely impatient. If 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 the, like the the the, the tiny the tiniest sort of consistent delay means that they will go to a, a, comp a competitor. So and, and and this is just getting started. You know, this, the GSM Asso Association predicts that in t in 2020 we will have 24 billion devices all connected to the internet, and all of these devices will not just run quad cores, not just eight cores, not 48 cores that we that you can buy pretty cheap today, but hundreds perhaps thousands of course. So we just, this like shift is, is really turning things around and it's just starting and it's happening now. And I really think that the only way to address this is to think differently. We can't, we can, we can, we can't just pretend that, 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 that things are like, they, like they've always been, right? We need to fundamentally change the way we think about software and how we design software from, 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 from ground up. And that is what we're trying to do. By, by sort of by this reactive systems movement, I don't know if, you, if, you, if you've heard if you've heard about that, but reactive systems really tr tr so try to strike distill the essence. What is needed for the future? What it, what are the core principles? And you know, get rid of all the buzzwords, really, and get 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 rid of all the vendor pitches. Going back in history, and I mean, learn from the from the from the from the guys right in the 70s and 80s, and see what actually have been proven to work. Because the knowledge in the from, 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 from the past is more relevant today than ever, I'd say. So reactive systems, they really need to be, I mean, I think all systems need to be fully responsive, right? But, but they, they don't need, n need to just be responsive when things are fine, like blue sky scenarios. But they need to be responsive when things start to fail. Right? Be, be responsive under crashes, re, re, be, 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 be responsible when things really go haywire. They also need to be fully responsive under like really varying load, right? When, when load like, 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 like peaks across the roof, sometimes completely unpredictable and sometimes actually planned, right? Over Christmas season, you know, the, the, the load might go up and you can actually plan for that. But sometimes you get slash dotted or whatever and, and, and things just start to to go really, really ugly, and there need to be. You, you, then you need to have solid principles and like be prepared to deal with that in a graceful manner. I'd say, and 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 the only way I'd say that to really do that is to sort of fully embrace the the sort of the the essence of 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 uh, of, uh, of, me of, me me of message driven architectures that I will talk more about later. If you want to, if, if you want to read more about this, we we post this reactive manifesto group. I mean, it's not from TypeSafe, it's a group of uh, like industry experts in the world and trying to try to like distill the essence. It's a, it's it can be some good some good reading. So what I want to try tr try to do now is like how Arca tries to address these issues from a sort of from the perspective of building reactive applications. I mean, building resilient systems that really can, can deal with failure gracefully, can, and building elastic systems that can really take advantage of, of the cloud and all the, all the multi-core archi architectures that we have. Okay, so starting with message-driven. You know, message-driven is really be able to like react to messages, to, 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 full, to fully embrace like a fully asynchronous and non-blocking and non model. And 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 so one of the key c characteristics of message driven is it gives you, like, just naturally, uh, as a, as a way like falls out of a fully message driven model, uh, I mean sort of a system that really never ever really blocks. You know, blocking is one of the most costly things you c you can do on modern on modern modern hardware. I mean, putting a thread to sleep and then waking it up because. Because you need some coordi some coordi coordination going go going on, right? Or, 
or, or, or, or you get cash invalidations and so on. That's extremely, uh, that's extremely costly. And you always need to think about opportunities to go async. That doesn't mean that you should like make every single object or every single, every single method sort of an as asynchronous method. But it's, it's, it's sort of to sort of mine the, the concurrency where it's, where it's available. Because a fully, I mean, fully event-driven con concurrent system usually tends to be very, very lazy. It used to just do things when, when they're told, right? So components, they, they're idling and they're, they are suspended. They don't sit on resources they, th that, that they don't use. And, and that, so that's sort of a system that is naturally, like coming from a message-driven perspective or angle, usually tends to utilize the hardware very, very efficiently. Uh, it, it, it also is a very nice model, as we talked about, for building a resili res resilient system and uh, like a fundamental sort of key trait in being elastic, as we'll talk about later. But, uh, but what is also m very important to, th to think about is that asynchronous m like communication is how the world works. That's how we all think, that's how we all communicate. We don't work through shared memory, right? We, haven't, we don't like look into each other's brains and start tampering with the, with, 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 with the thoughts. We ask each other we, we all, and we all like com communicate through like sort of sending messages in a way and we all do things completely in independently still and it's not we don't think it's anything like hard with that that's how how society always and humans always interacted with each other but then still we try to like shoehorn everything to like a single system image like a single consistent view of the world and I think we just have to let, let, let go of that and instead rely on solid principles in order to, to, to actually sort of deal with consensus where it's needed, but not everywhere, because that's just not needed. It's just the way we're used to deal with, with, with things like this. Right? So, so the, the fundamental way we do this in ACA is, is something where we, we, we rely on something called the actor model. Have you heard of the actor model? Some of them have. Yeah, Arca is very inspired by Erlang. I was just I was just talking with with, with Safe this. I mean, in in the in the in the in the break here that we. Uh, I mean, I was I was an Erlang developer in Erlang from Ericsson, and 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 they have extremely good reputation for reliability. I mean, you, they, they they used to to power these like t these, t t these telecom switches that that powers one one or nine one one the one one two in Sweden. I should know that, uh, and uh, uh, that was that's what got me interested, right? What is it that these guys do? They have this obscure language, right? I mean, uh, this this really weird VM, but they do something right. They have this insane uptime, right? And and I and I, and I, and I started learning Erlang, and but I lived my life on the JVM, and I felt these these. These, pr these principles are so, are so solid. We just need to like tell the gospel to the to the Java world and the, C, the, and, the and the C sharp sharp guys and, and 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 stuff like that. So I started porting over some of these principles and fully embracing the actor model. And out of that came Aka. So the actor model, if you just from a theoretical pr perspective, is it is it is a like full computation model, like like lambda calculus or or or. or or, or so that embodies three things. It makes processing first class, it makes storage first class, and it makes communication first class. And by making communication first class, it simplifies a lot of things, I think. And and uh, so so when an actor supports like three different axioms, you can say. When uh, whenever an actor receives a message, it can do one one out of three things. It can first create new actors, and, and like hold on to them and start delegating work to other ones. It can send messages to actors it already knows. And it can also change its behavior for how it should be act when the next message comes, or comes around. That is something called become, and like as dynamicity to the actor model is extremely powerful. Actor systems can change, and they can evolve, and they can adapt as the system is being used. That is not something that you can do naturally in, in something like, like, like classes in C++ and so on. You can do some of that in Ruby using metaprogramming and stuff, stuff like that, but actors make it very, very simple. So how do actors work? Yeah, first, the first thing, a very imp important thing that they do is that they separate the runtime instance from the reference that points to, 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 to that instance. And this level of indirection gives us a lot of freedom. First, it gives us the possibility to add a message queue. We call it the mailbox. So as soon as you send, send a message to an actor, how do I point here? I can't point with this one. 
It doesn't matter. I it's fine. Oh, old school. Old school. <laughs> okay. So when you, when you send a message to the actor, it actually it, in there, there might be a transport in between, like a network, or it might run run in process. But what, what's going to happen? That you, you're just going to put it on this on this mailbox, and then your as a, as a sender are done. Then it's the scheduler's responsibility to take these messages in order and apply them to the behavior. Perhaps updating the state if things go wrong, as we'll talk more about later. We have we have failure a failure model built into the actor model that that will deal with this. So each actor the actor they have their own mailbox, and and the interesting thing is that actors are fully thread safe. They actually run by taking each message and run it on a on a thread one by one. So if you just run if you just run one actor in the system in your system, you have basically have a single threaded system, no concurrency. You don't make use of any of your of your of your of your, of your cores. But, but what's happening? Normally, what you, what you should do is like embrace the fact that actors are extremely lightweight. They are not bound to threads. They, they, like, you, they just like multiplex on top of a thread pool and, if, and using a very efficient scheduler. So you can easily run millions of actors on, like, co com on commodity hardware. I can easily spin up like two, three million actors running concurrently on, on, this, on this laptop. Each actor is only bound by memory, and the memory is about 300 bytes. C compare this to I mean, programming with threads in Java or, or C++ or whatever, where, where, where you usually have like a cap on like 5,000 threads. This gives you a very powerful design tool. You can really model like one million concurrent users, all running and doing things in parallel. So th that's, that is extremely par par powerful. Uh, the, o the other thing that we will come back to is that actors are fully isolated. You, 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 you probably heard about encapsulation in, 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 in Java or so, or so. It's just it's just a it's just a fake, right? There, 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 there's really no encapsulation. There are some syntactic things that 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 that's in the language that allows you to to, to like to like or like to like fools you into thinking that the, the system is fully encapsulated. But uh, when you actually run it, there's there, there's no such thing. In, if, you, if you use actors, each component is actually fully isolated, and that means that you can't actually tamper with someone else's state. You have to ask him to do that himself. And this isolation gives a lot of freedom. First, it gives you the possibility of actually dealing with failure where it's happening, and, 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 with, and not risking it to spread to other components, dealing to cascading failures that we see way too often in the, in, in the industry today. This, and the second thing, as I said, it, it actually decouples the, the runtime instance from the reference. It means that you can run this runtime instance anywhere. There might be a network in between here. There might, first, when you instantiate this guy, it might be that, be that there is an, it, it actually runs in process, but the runtime decides that it's more efficient to move this guy over here because he's using a lot of data over there. Then it can mo be moved. And, and these, so, so, this means the, the, the topology of your actor system can sort of change while it's running, depending on how things are being used. That's also a very, a very powerful thing. So if we look now, I don't think I need this. If we, if we look now into how, how you will write such an actor, first, when you write an actor, you first need to think about which messages do I expose, which messages can I like, respond to. The messages in an actor system, or, or in an actor, is really the public API. So here we create a simple message called greeting, and then we create an actor called greeting actor. This is Scala, by the way. Akka is a Java and a Scala API. I'm just showing the Scala because it's a little bit less code. Uh, but uh, they are like semantically and, and functionally equivalent to each other. They almost look the same now in Java 8, by the way, if you're into that. So what we have to do first is that we have to define the receive method. The receive method defines how, well, how the actor should respond to a message. And in, here we're using I mean, Scala's nice pattern matching. This case greeting to means that I'll try to match on that, on that class. If there is a match, then I'm running the, the, the code after this, this arrow here. And it also, pa pattern matching in Scala also gives you a way to like introspect, so I can actually take the who in variable here, a string, and just, and just use it there. But that's like just Scala syntax. But the interesting thing is here, here I can actually choose which, which messages I should respond to. 
And uh, th th this actor is stateless. Most actors are actually stateful. That's what m makes actors beautiful. They are long-lived stateful computation that can be that can like be long-lived in the sense that they can recover from failure, they can be migrated, they can be replicated, and so on. So you start by creating an actor system. As I said, one actor is really no actor. An ac actor always comes in systems, and you should create many of them. And you create this actor using this actor of. I don't say new actor, uh, new greeter. I, I, I create it through this factory method, and out of this thing comes oops, something called an actor ref. That is my reference to my, to my, to my actor, and I'll, I'll come back to why that is important later. I can then use this, this reference and, and by sending a message to that actor using the tell method. I'm telling the actor to do, to do something. Okay. This method returns immediately. It just puts the message on the actor's mailbox, and then the, my job is done. Then it's up to the scheduler to, to schedule the actor in the, in the most efficient way to actually do his processing. Right? So that's how it works. The resilience is one of the most important things I said. The system really is always need to be responsive. It needs to be responsive under the face of failure. It needs to, need to react to messages. And, and resilience really is defined as not just fault tolerance, but actually resilience means like spring back to shape completely, being fully, I mean, recovered. And uh, actor systems can really give, give you that. It goes beyond fault tolerance and just high availability and so on. And, and I think that resilience is really something that we should completely rethink we, the way we do. It's usually something that we just slap onto our systems like af after the fact. That's just wrong. We sh it should be, it's, it's, it's part of the system's life cycle, especially if you run a distributed system and things will fail. Trust me, they will fail. Else you'll be just living in your bubble for too long. So instead, embrace that things will fail and design for failure. If you look at failure, as a non-exceptional thing. It's just a natural state in the application's life cycle. So, I mean, things go well, and I re re receive things, and then, th then things starting to fail. OK, no worries. So I, that's part of my model. And then it can spring back into shape and continuing to serve users. If you, like, if you do that, if you like ma embrace failure like that, and have a, and ha then you have a way of designing for failure and fully embrace failure. And, 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 I, and, and I, I think that is sort of the, the key. Uh, one of the key cont contributions of the, of the actor model, that it gives you, essentially what it gives you, since it relies on asynchronous message passing, it gives you a way of having full isolation, not just syntactical, but really full isolation. It means that the actor can, can be dealt with failure at a, where exactly where it happens, right? At the very fine-grained level, instead of as, as often as we used to, I mean, I mean the, the granularities, these are app servers. Right, and then we have expensive clustering software. Oh, I'm redirecting the, the load balancer here and send all the user requests to my second instance of my app server here, like WebLogic web, web server clustering or whatever. That's just wrong. It's extremely expensive, and just redirecting all the users over to this guy. What means that means that he's, he he will get twice the load. What's going to happen? I mean, if that guy couldn't keep up, do you think this guy will? No, he will go down and like three x the load here, four x the load here, and so on. Well, take down the whole system. Instead, why not deal with failure where it's happening exactly, right? And the important thing is that this is not a new concept. This is how the ship industry have, have, have dealt with the problem from day one. They call it bulkheading, right? Where they actually isolate, they actually break up the ship into, into individual co compartments. If, they, if one of the compartments is ripped up, filled up with water, it doesn't affect the rest of the system. And if enough compartments are healthy, then the, s the ship can continue to sail, al sail along. And hopefully you can, like, can like, empty them of water and, and, you, and you go back to, to shape. Else you have only fault tolerance. Resilience means that you actually should go back into shape fully. So, so well, what, what, is, what is also nice and also sort of key is that if you, if, if you rely on a fully message-driven core, then you can treat messages no, treat failures as messages. And guess what? If, if, you d if, if, if your system is designed to, like, as its workflow of messages, that means that errors are just regular workflow, because they're just regular messages. Y you, you just notify, I mean, part of your workflow that things went wrong, and someone can take action on, upon that. There's so many things can be simplified by unifying things. Are you with me? 
So on top of this now, we have something called supervision. Okay? So normally you design systems in, in, in actors, in Erlang or in, or in Arca, using supervisor hierarchies. Here we have our greeter actor here, you can see. He sits right on top of, on right, right, right underneath sort of a, a hidden sort of top level supervisor. That, that, that if you run Arca cluster, is also sort of a cluster. But the, imp the important thing here now is if I, if I, in my greeter, create a child actor, sort of someone I want to delegate work to, till, then he becomes my, my child, then it becomes my responsibility as the parent. And that means that I am responsible for, this fail for like f dealing with failure, dealing with the life cycle, restarting him if things go wrong, or if I don't have enough knowledge, I mean, then you can de declaratively say that if I can't deal with the failure, then I'm escalating. So if things start to go, go wrong here, then A will get the not a notification, things went wrong. He, will tr he, he, he can try to, try to repair the problem, but like get, if, if it's like in Java, an out of memory exception, there's really no way that A can deal with that, even though even doesn't matter how hard he tries. So then he will escalate up to greeter. Now, guess not. Gr the, the greeter actor can't deal with an out of memory error either. If you actually hit the top level, we call it the guardian actor, and he can't do any much about it either. Then you need to have have, have sort of have uh, sort of the elasticity sort of uh, part of of reactive systems in place. So someone else on some other machine will be notified that that whole actor tree subtree is out of the picture and can in reinstantiate that actor tree on, on, on his node or on, so on someone else's node. So th th that brings me to elasticity. Uh, elasticity really is, is, is about being, s being able to stay responsive under variable load, scale on demand. And that, mean th that doesn't mean, it, do it doesn't just mean scale up, right? Adding more resources. It also means that for cost efficient reasons, scale down. We, I mean, we, we, have, we, we have customers that, that, that have like 10 orders of magnitude more, more load for some certain peak periods. Why should they buy 10 orders of magnitude more hardware? Is, that's, that's insane. The promise of cloud computing is like utility computing. Pay for what you need, and pay for what you actually use. And that means there are software needs to have a way of, of, of leveraging that. It doesn't matter if the hardware or, the, or like EC2 or whatever gives you that tool. If you had to reinvent the wheel and, and add custom code every single time. The, the, the platform or software platform should nat to natively be able to deal with this. Like scale, scale up and, sc and, and scale down depending on usage. So, and, and, and I, I, I really think that the way sort of to, to look at things is that scaling up, when, when I say scale up, I mean, sc I mean you, you, so utilizing multi-core architectures and scale out, meaning utilizing multiple nodes, is essentially the same thing. It's, there's really no difference. If you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you like fully embrace that model, then I think a lot of simplifications can, can happen. What I, what, what, if, if you look at, without getting too, too technical, if you, if you look at modern CPU architectures, you actually ha you have usually multiple processors, and, and you have some sort of QPI link between, where actually message passing happens. It really doesn't matter if these two processors sit on the in, in the same uh, uh, in the same CPU or on two different machines. They are just different processes, fully isolated, with with their own memory, communicating through asynchronous message passing, either in the same same machine or across machines. It means that distributed systems is what we all do today. There's nothing special about it. As soon as you have more than one core, you, you're, you're doing distributed system programming. And just embracing that means that we can unify things and simplify things. And, and I think actors and message passing concurrency, message passing really, really does that because it embraces sort of network programming or distributed systems from uh, from uh, and the and the essence of it because the, the essence of, of distributed systems is really sh I mean fully share nothing architectures and and uh, and uh, and actually message passing. So the two things we need to do is that we need to minimize contention. Contention is a real the biggest scalability killer that you can have. Like it's, and scalability is like underlies elasticity. And we need to maximize locality of reference. And what I mean by that is that utilizing single writer principle. I mean. 
use the fact that like, having a single thread just writing to a single memory location is extremely fast. It's just when you start adding coordination that things get slow. Are you with me? And, th and also maximizing locality re reference means that things that are used together, let them sit together in code. That means that, 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 that I mean, all the CPU caching, like the cache invalidations will go down and, and so on. You don't have to ship data around needlessly and so on. So essentially is embracing a fully share, share nothing architecture, embracing that we are all doing distributed systems. And just by relying on, on that and thinking and designing our systems to be message based and relying on a share nothing architecture, meaning that something like actors, where, where state is local within the actor, and just communicating through, through async message passing really simplifies things. Because what you do then, then you don't have to hard code the topology in your application I mean, when you actually write the system. If, if everything is sort of distributable, if all these components are mobile, they, are all like they, they, have, they have their own state and that is completely isolated from each other, that means they can actually move around. And th this means that elasticity is actually pretty easy. So, j j just to try to highlight, see how much time do I have? Three more minutes. Oh, I'm running out of time. But uh, just to highlight what I'm, what I'm trying to, sh huh? <laughs> I got five minutes. Okay, thank you. Then I can go back one slide. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, so, so yeah, I just, I, I just want to say one thing here. Location tra transparency is what is what we call it, and, it, and it's it's actually the opposite of transparent di distributed computing. It's embracing the network and all its limitation and constraints. The messages can fail, I mean, being lost. That the network can drop. That that. Uh, uh, that you like have partial failures. All of that things need to be first class. You know, we're used to. I mean, if you're old enough, you're used to RPC systems like Corba and all this stuff. They try to go they do the opposite way. They try to like hide and think and uh, pretend that we're all running in process. Life's happy, right? The von Neumann architecture. I am full control of my universe, right? But that's not the case any longer. Instead, trying to uh, fully embrace that that is a lie. And 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 have have a model that sort of un, takes that in, that into ac ac account, and 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 location um, something that I mean, a model that is location transparent and relies on message passing really can give can give you that. So what I'm trying to sh just to try to highlight what, what what that means. You remember this code here. How can we now make this location transparent? Well, what 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 I mean is that when I create this actor here. It shouldn't really matter if, if I mean, if I mean, wherever I want to run this actor, act, you know, I'm getting the actor ref out here. So, is is how can I then make sure that sort of that that that, that, that I can that i that my system is 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 is, is fully lo location transparent and that I can actually run this somewhere else wherever it might need. At, at, this, at this point, then I can then I should just be able to do that through co through configuration. It shouldn't belong in the code, right? Because the ops guy might actually have a different view. You might actually deploy this in a very different environment than than you, than you like ran, ran your staging as a, as, a, as 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 a developer. Or as I said earlier, the runtime might actually decide that the ops guy is actually wrong. The system is being used in a very different way, and he might want to actually allocate that that instance somewhere else completely. And then you should be able to do that just through configuration. So here we have this greeter actor that we talked about. And here I'm just saying that I want to run this. I'm gonna, when I instantiate, I don't want to instantiate him locally. I just want, instead I want to instantiate him, you know, him on, this, on this node available on this port. Or I perhaps say that I, d I, d I, d I don't even want it to be a single actor. I want him to represent a pool of actors. And I want to, as soon as, and the first message he gets, I want him to like transform himself to be pool, start app actors on multiple machines and start redirecting work to all of these, perhaps living on, on, on different machines. Then I can do that all through configuration because I have the separation between actor ref and runtime instance. Things are completely location transparent. Or I, I might perhaps want to say, I don't want to hard code anything, not even in the configuration file. I just want 
ACA cluster to, 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 to really take care of it. And I want to make them, may, I want to make my, my, my this, in this case, router fully cluster aware. That means that as soon as I spin up, act, spin up nodes, the actor will realize that and start allocating sort of routees on these different new nodes. And when I start taking them down, it will like shrink the cluster and start migrating actors over. And all that is possible now through 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 Aka cluster, which gi basically gives. If if you've heard about React and Dynamo, it basically is like it sort of has a lot of heritage to the Dynamo paper and the React database. It's a fully decentralized peer-to-peer -peer model, which means that for you as a user, you can just start adding nodes and and remove nodes, and the system will detect that, and 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 like repartition the system basically depending on, 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 on how it's being used. And the key thing here is yet again, by having this level of indirection, by having share nothing state, and by relying on message passing, the system has all the opportunities in the world to actually just repartition the system any way it wants. Because these references are stable. Me as a client, I don't care, need, I don't need to care. Latency might be high, but the overall, or overall throughput and overall latency will hopefully go down when the runtime can start optimizing the system. So that was all I had. Sorry if I ran over time. So if you want to know more, go to aka.io. We have a lot of documentation there, samples and stuff. And, and uh, uh, yeah, that's basically it. Thanks. Thank you, Jonas, for acting out the actor model. And I think we have, there's one or two quick questions. We have time while we uh, switch here, OK? Um, you mentioned one scenario where you had a, a, a cluster and the load balancer, and if, if one cluster went down, the uh, something powered up something on the or switched the load to another cluster, and then it got overloaded, and that brought the system down, and so forth. Uh, and that was a bad scenario, if I understand things right. Then you proceeded to show this this graph with a supervisor on top, and then you said that, oh, uh, if this entire cluster goes down, then something will. Uh, notice that the, uh, the failure couldn't be handled and it will switch over things to another cluster. Uh, no. yeah. Now I'm confused about the difference between those yeah. two scenarios. Yeah, that, that is a good question. The, the, the point I was trying to make is that if, if the granularity is, is the monolithic app server, then everything needs to be moved at, one, at, at once, right? Then, then, then you don't have the, the opportunity as we do to actually take certain parts of the graph and move, move and move that over here, and, and other parts of the graph and to move to move that over here. Uh, if if your system is really, I mean, if the failure is 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 extremely like, if the granularity of the failure of, of your component is really really fine grain, then then you can actually slice and dice the system in any way you want. And we have predefined algorithms that do that. But you can also hook in your own, right? Uh, 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 so I, I think the, the, the essential here is, is to see, is, is, is to try to address the problem at its at, at its like smallest point, instead of just relying on 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 on, on these like coarse grain monolithic app servers or sometimes even running more than one application, sometimes hundreds of applications, and they all come and live it at once in one single unit. Anyway, I don't know if that answers your question, but. But 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 um, gives you more freedom to like partition, slice and dice. Yeah. I think we have some coffee break also. I think it. One more question here, somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, I guess in 1986, Joe Armstrong was having the same message as you have now. Yeah. And um, I was still talking to him to one year ago, basically discussing the same principles about share nothing architecture and had very recently a discussion with one of my managers driving my project and he was talking about seamless scalability because the cloud was going to enable that. Yeah. Um, so my question is what has happened in these 30 years and what's different today? Yes, yeah, a very good question. So, so I I mean, I mean, Joe Armstrong actually wasn't the first one. The, the first time I, 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 I ran it was, 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 was Jim Gray's and Pat Helen's tandem systems. Were Hello, can you hear me? Was 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 Jim Gray's and and, and Pat Helen's uh, I mean, um, t tandem systems like th th that actually applied share nothing architectures. So my point with that is that like that that, that was all the way back in the 70s and 70s and 80s. I mean, oh, these are solid principles, right? That that, that but, but I think that so much have happened 
I mean, they were these guys were like before their time, I think. And and and, and sure, there there was a need to for this isolation and, and, com, and compartmentalization and these things, for 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 building reliable systems. So that was essentially what 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 Tandem did, like this nonstop uh, uh, architecture. ar architectures and stuff like that, right? But 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 today it's everywhere. It's not for specialized systems. You you, you really can't escape it. Every one of us are doing di 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 distributed systems, as I said both on a single machine, but also when I mean, talking to cloud services, using like Twitter APIs or Dropbox or whatever, and, and mobile clients are usually stateful, right? And, and that means that when they detach and come back online, you need to sync state. That also all the problems of, of distributed comp like computing comes back, right? How do you merge that safely and so on? So I think like, so, so the realities were catched up. And, and now we need the, the, like the knowledge these, the, 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 these guys sort of explored more than ever, I'd say. Yeah. Well, no, I just wanted to emphasize what you said, because the difference between, say, 20 years ago and now, that virtually every application now is a distributed application. Hmm? Yeah. And every application needs these techniques. They didn't need to have that before. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. OK, thank you, Jonas, again. Thank you.